Let me... Great. So we are recording and we're going to go ahead and just do a quick round of introductions. So I'll kick things off. Hi, my name is Emma Oppenheim. I'm the Medicaid Transformation Project Director. Work quite closely with everybody on reentry. I'll turn things over to Tyron to say hello. And I should have my audio on. Good, good morning, everyone. I'm Tyron Nixon, the Transformation Implementation Manager. And like uh, Emma, I work with closely with everyone on the panel here. Thank you. And I'll turn it over to, uh, let's go with Mark. Hi, Mark Stern. Um, I'm the medical liaison uh, between WASPIC and uh, Healthcare Authority. Uh, Rick. Thanks, Mark. I'm Rick Bishop, a retired chief deputy with the Clark County Sheriff's Office and currently the WASPIC jail liaison. And I'm in Spokane at the WASPIC uh, conference that's wrapping up. Okay, I'll turn it over to Lisa. Good morning. My name is Lisa Flynn. I am with the Washington State Department of Corrections. I am the 1115 Demonstration Waiver Administrator and working to um, work with HCA to deliver um, the demonstration uh, to our recipients in our carceral facilities. And I'll turn it over to Teresa. Thanks, Lisa. Teresa Tamara. I'm operations and engagement strategist working with HCA and really behind the scenes on a lot of the MTP waiver work. So, and we also have Arthur from HCA. Arthur? Hi, I'm Arthur Andrews. I'm an occupational nurse consultant here at the HCA, and my focus is reentry services. So, who has it gone? Bagisha. Hi, I'm uh, Josiah Cranes. I am the Juvenile Rehabilitation Liaison uh, here at HCA, and I work under the Eligibility Policy Innovation and Community Supports Team. Sorry about that, Gisia. Uh Julia, <laughs> who makes this whole thing work. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julia Wilson. I'm an Administrative Assistant over at the Healthcare Authority. Great. And did we get everybody? I think everybody, yes. So like last time, no real set agenda today. We just wanna open things up for questions that any facility might have, any representative of a facility might have. So happy to take questions either in chat or you can raise your hand and we'll unmute you. Hey Emma, how about if I break the awkward uh, silence and uh, we can, uh, when we we're in the green room, we can discuss the uh, supplanting question that I'll be submitting. Uh, a lot of the local facilities uh, that were uh, uh, jail administrators who were here at attendance at uh, WASPIC are concerned about supplanting and the question of uh, grants as well as local dollars that uh, they're currently uh, using and that this program may be able to free up so they can do other reentry services, but it's classic supplanting. And uh, I'll be um, providing that question to HCA and uh, hopefully get an answer back so folks can uh, move forward. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rick. And I will just quickly say we have been talking about this internally. So our understanding is that you can use grant funding and local funding on top of a reimbursement to just provide additional uh, dollars for someone's salary, essentially, et cetera. And we were told that you do need to adhere to the terms of your grants, any terms associated with local funding, but that otherwise it's your dollars to spend. So we're gonna provide a more concrete and writing response to that question because we know it's top of mind for folks. And so just to- just to, uh, yeah, before we go on to that one, just to piggyback on um, on this issue, I'm assuming um, that the whole supplant supplement issue only applies to the money that um, is billed to Medicaid. It's not going to apply to any of the the primer money, the IT money, and the uh, and the readiness money. Is that right? I think we should provide an answer to that. Okay. Meeting. Well, just yeah. Just get in, just then when you do, just can consider that too, because people are going to, um, there may be a difference. 
That sounds good. And, and I actually would say that I think the bigger concern would be any state or federal grants you're receiving and just making sure that you understand the terms of those grants. So if there is a condition of that grant that says if you receive other funding for a similar or the same activity and you can't use these dollars for that activity as well, I think that would be the requirement. But so it, it would be a case by case basis, but we can definitely get you more information on that and put this into writing. And the other thing I would add is just a, a plug for the FAQs, because really we are using those to answer questions that we know that multiple people might have and giving an official answer. And so please, if you've got questions, we'll certainly, that's part of why we're here today is to sort of answer them if we can. And we might, um, we'll put a lot of these questions actually in the FAQs for people who were not able to participate today. So they, in fact, can get their questions asked and answered and everybody else can see them. And uh, thanks, Emma, for putting the um, the FAQ, sort of where you send the questions to, and we'll we'll take care of those. We're a little bit behind. It's not an immediate answer, but we're working on those. And we often check with other people within the organization and the agency to see what the, the correct answers is and the official answer. So we're all speaking with one source of truth. So, and Emma, the question I put in the chat, so we would have record of it and probably need to do a little bit more research. One of the questions our substance abuse and recovery unit staff asked is for an individual who releases prison into an inpatient treatment program um, and it needs the facility staff at the inpatient treatment find that they should go beyond the 28 days that standard Medicaid funding provides. Is there in any any flexibility in Medicaid paying for additional days? Is there any other options for paying for that if the clinical staff and the inpatient treatment believe that that individual needs to stay longer? Okay, great question. I think not necessarily a waiver specific question, but we can take let's take that one back and probably get an answer from our managed care teams and then get back to you. And I can put, you know, I'm going to put this question into the general chat so everybody can see it. For those of you that are calling in, this is just office hours. So really, it's your chance to ask questions or um, whatever you might need to hear from HCA and our um, DOC WASPIC uh, folks on the DCYF. Uh, whoever's here on the call on the panel, we're happy to answer questions. And again, if we can't answer them right now, we're certainly going to follow up. And just like Amy is doing, please raise your hand and we can call on you. Go ahead and come off uh, mute and let's see if we can hear you. Amy? Hi, are you able to hear me? We are. So I had asked several questions via email and I've received a response back, but much of it, I mean, actually all the questions I asked seemed to be things that they were still working on. Our initial plan was to try and be in the first cohort, but we really can't do that until we have the answers to some of these questions. So for example, about pharmaceutical, there's concerns about how we're going to manage the 30 day supply at release out of a jail when we don't know when they're being released. So it brings up a number of questions such as if they're released bail out in the middle of the night um, if they're released after hours, we do release up to 8 p.m. So the pharmacies, many would be closed or unable to fill those. And it's just such a quick turnaround because they'll come out of court and they're released and we need to let them go. So I, I wasn't sure how that's supposed to work. And there's some meds that wouldn't be appropriate to give 30 days worth. Um, we also asked questions about the reimbursement rates because we know that the reimbursement rates, we have a contracted provider as do many jails. The reimbursement rates won't, won't cover all the costs that it cost us. And so we were trying to get a sense of, we don't wanna sign our county up for something and they go, oh, this is actually gonna cost you more money. Um, so that question came up. Um, I think those are the two main ones. Uh, the other one was if we did sign up and 
We used some of the setup fees, but then learned at a later date that the reimbursement rates weren't covering our cost. Would we then have to repay the amount used to set up? And then the other answer that I got back from them was it really was intended more to use kind of local providers who were already Medicaid enrolled as opposed to using contracted providers that specialize in jail medicine. And that was concerning to us because I can tell you our local providers aren't set up to be jail providers, nor are they interested in doing that. So just wanted to get clarification on those things. So I can go through those questions. I have the email that you sent us. So there have been questions about what will the Medicaid rates be and what can we expect in terms of reimbursement. And I do want to punt that question to a later date. We will be releasing more information on Medicaid billing rates, the specific services we will cover. That's all going to come in the fall. So I know that's unfortunate and I and everybody wants that information now, but please bear with us. When we release that information, we're also going to try to release information on like what an average reimbursement might look like. So that was one of your questions. Um, there would not be an obligation to return funds used for setup as long as you're participating in cohorts and meeting cohort requirements. So just a reminder that for the first milestone, which is our intent to participate form, uh, that's associated with funding and you're going to receive funding after you submit that form and sign our contract and get set up in our payment portals and we'll have more information coming on those pieces. And that funding can be used to help craft the capacity building application that we'll release at a later date. And so, but the capacity building application would need to be accepted. The readiness review criteria would need to be accepted for there to be more funding gates. So I think there are some boundaries there. And I'm seeing some hands from DOC and Rick. So Lisa, Rick, please feel free to jump in. I'll just jump in for a second. Thank you. Uh, Amy, are you with the uh, jail security staff or correction staff, or are you with uh, another part of the uh, county government? I'm with the, I'm public health, but I work in the jail okay. with our jail administration at Skagit. Okay. Okay, good. Um, one of the I uh, work with the courts district court in particular, uh, because they have some latitude in when they can uh, authorize a release. And occasionally they will write the court order, which would have to go to the sheriff's records or uh, records department that says release at either the discretion of the sheriff or no later than the next day. So you can do that. Or um, they, they, have a, they, they can write some language where it covers the sheriff holding the person and usually they'll work with the person in court so they understand why they're being held. And because uh, you said you release up to 8 p.m. or 2,000 hours. So if you can get the releases either earlier, and I know that there's a problem because you've, I think Skagit's 400 uh, people in your facility. Uh, it's tough to, to do that after court, but maybe the next day. So just something uh, that you may want to consider is, uh, talking with your chief over there. And they can give me a call or or shout out before you all make a decision. And I can explain some of the, the strategies that I've seen around the state. Thank you. Thank you, Rick, that's helpful. And Amy, could you clarify, you were saying something uh, when you asked about the medications, you said for some medications, it may not be appropriate. what did you mean by that? So for example, if someone's on methadone, we're not going to give them 30 days worth of methadone, but it's also through a contract with our methadone provider in the community. Um, or if it's, a, you know, another med, I don't know off the top of my head, but some of the psych meds we may not, with someone that's not really very stable, it might not be appropriate to give them 30 days of all their meds for fear that they misuse them either intentionally or non-intentionally putting them at risk. So there was a lot of concerns over that. And then, you know, of course, like if they're on an antibiotic, then it's a 10 day supply or whatever their antibiotic treatment regimen yeah. is. 
Emma, I think Jason, if I remember correctly, Jason um, addressed this um, a while back when we were in, in other venues. And I think the word appropriate was was part of it, that um, it's 30 days supply when it's appropriate. So your antibiotic example is really good. If you know the course of therapy is 10 days, no, we're not going to give them 30 days or give them 10 days. And I think for other things, and, and Emma, maybe this is something we need to research a little bit, but I'll put on the table. As long as you, I, I would think as long as you've made arrangements, for example, if the person has an appointment in the methadone clinic in 10 in 10 days and you give them a nine day or whatever, 10 day supply to get them to the appointment. We uh, let's research if that would be um, acceptable. I, I think clinically it would be as long again, as we, as we've made arrangements. Makes sense. I, I just think there needs to be some clarifications on that. Yeah. Um, you know, before I know our County is right. going to be comfortable moving forward. I, I think you're familiar with NAFCARE's way of administering meds. And so because we're not a compounding pharmacy, can't just put it together in-house. It would have to go out through a pharmacy or some other mechanism to manage that. that that's going to be another issue, but let let the healthcare authority do a little bit of research we'll, and we'll get that in the FA, um, FAQs. I will just thank you. Thank you so much. I'll just quickly add that on the pharmacy question, we're certainly getting this question from quite a lot of folks. We're really hoping to release some guidance later this summer to provide basically some options that facilities could use to meet this requirement and maybe a little bit more information on the guardrail. So there's no questions about what about 30 days if I feel like that's not safe for a patient. But then Arthur, I'll turn things over to you. Yeah, I just wanted to add that we, you know, we're we're in we're currently starting those conversations internally with our pharmacy group and and getting information from you know DOC, getting information from some jails, from the MCOs, from all kinds of different resources, so that we can look at that and look at those very questions, Amy. Because um, you know, as a nurse, I understand that you know you guys also have you know quick turnarounds and in, in what's appropriate and how do we deal with that and and, and what does that look like um, for the jails as opposed to you know somebody for like. DOC when they know somebody's releasing well in advance, you know, they, you know, sometimes there's some planning that can happen, but sometimes there's not planning that can happen. And so we are really looking at that question internally and so that we can provide guidance at a later time, like Emma said. So, yeah. Perfect. While you guys are discussing that, one of the other things that came up that you might want to throw into your discussion is if somebody you know, we release them, we give them 30 days of meds, but that they're rebooked in two weeks and you know either they do or don't still have their meds with them what what do we do with those cases so just for you guys to discuss that as well yeah and that makes sense i, I worked in the er environment we experienced that in the er environment as well so hey, let me just uh, make sure we understand the question amy with regard to the readmission are you are you saying that are you asking like whether medicaid would pay if, if there there's still two weeks left on their prescription and they didn't bring it with them are you asking whether you'd be you'd be reimbursed by medicaid if you re-up that prescription while they're in house or are you asking a different question no we well, i mean we would of course medicate them while they're in house but then the question would be say they're rebooked two weeks later we've already given them 30 days of meds and and then they're only going to be here for a couple of days. We're releasing again. Do we give them 30 days of meds again? Do we give them two weeks of meds? Do we? You're saying would the, would the previous, would you be covered by the previous prescription since you gave them enough medication that should cover it? Got it. Yeah. We can provide a formal response to that as well. Lisa, go ahead. So one of the other questions that came up in, in some of our groups was um, DOC is getting ready to submit their letter of intent so we can participate with four of our facilities, starting with four of our facilities in cohort one. In the description, it indicates that we'll have to prepare this readiness assessment. Um, and the question around that is, what does the readiness assessment look like and what can the prisons and the jails um, do to prepare for answering that readiness assessment to ensure they're ready to go. 
So that is a great question. And let me use that question to talk through some of the next steps that are coming. So we've talked quite a bit about this capacity building application. And my hope is that we're going to have a document for you on in July, early July. And that's when everybody would be able to get started working on that. And so the capacity building application will ask facilities to talk about each of the mandated requirements of the program. So let's just talk about the required benefits, for example, and how each facility is going to meet that requirement, either through in-house staff that they have or through working with community-based providers, possibly working with our third-party administrative um, vendor. And so they're gonna just describe what we have in-house, what we need, and what we're going to work on to be able to go live in the program. So that's what the capacity building application is at a high level. The readiness review, we really don't want people to feel scared about the readiness review. It's just going to be a confirmation that the things that we talked about in the capacity building application were met. So when it comes time to do the readiness review, we're going to have the same list of requirements for the program and say, okay, in the fall, you told us that you had this in-house case manager, but you needed another case manager, and you were going to have that support come from the community. Were you able to get that person in place? Do you have a policy and procedure for working with that person? Those are going to be the types of questions that we ask you in the readiness review. So really, there should be no surprises, and it should just be a follow-up, a handshake to that capacity building application that you submit to us in the fall. And then I think the other thing I want to say about readiness review is, that we're going to have touch points throughout the year. So we're going to have a late summer touch point with everyone to make sure that you're on track for the capacity building application. We're going to have a winter touch point with all facilities to make sure that you're on track for getting ready for the readiness review. It shouldn't be a surprise if there's things that are coming that you feel like you're not ready and prepared for. And we want to work with you to make sure that we can get everything in place to go live. So we don't have to start you on July 1 if you feel like you're not ready or if you're not able to meet all the pieces of the readiness review. We can wait until you are ready and you have everything in place. So just want to make it clear that it's a relationship, it's a, a handshake, and we'll work with you to get ready. So, and there should be no surprises. <laughs> so, so good. What I, what I hear you saying then is if we submit a letter of intent to start on July 1st of next year and through this readiness assessment process, we discover we're missing a piece, the HCA will work with us to push it forward so that we can accommodate that next requirement. Absolutely. And I'm really hoping that that really, no one's finding out about something they don't know at the readiness review step. They, they should know what they need to work on with the capacity building application. And then we'll have a number of months to figure out, okay, are we able to put that in place or what else do we need to do to make that happen? Perfect. Thank you. Great. So Emma, we have some questions in the chat. So if a jail does not participate, this is from Anna Hobson. If a jail does not participate in the reentry program, will they be able to utilize Medicaid billing for their clients? So they cannot. You do have to be in a cohort to be able to bill Medicaid for the targeted pre-release services. So that's why it's so important to pick a cohort and join us. And if you have concerns about that, then please let us know and we're happy to talk more about it with your facility. And then there's another question from Brandy DeFazio. Do we need to have a licensed BHA facility to participate in the waiver? I think I know the answer to that one, but I'm going to let you or Arthur answer that one. Well, and I would I would say I, don't, I think the answer is no, but maybe Arthur, if you want to jump in here and provide more response. Um, are, in, are you talking about like if your jail is a licensed BHA facility? I'm trying to get more clarification on that question. And when we say jail, we also mean prison. So we should be really thoughtful. It's just facilities. So when we were, we're using them interchangeably, but they are not interchangeable. So let's just sort of call them facilities. And we mean all of it when we are talking, we're use, we're getting used to the language. So just, just wanted to put that caveat in there. And yes, this is to our, our, okay. our intent here is to supplement what you're already utilizing in your jail or help identify with the TPA uh, resources that can be used for these things. So no, I, I'm I'm not aware of any conversations that have happened where you would need to be a licensed BHA facility uh, to participate in the waiver. Um, you know, we want to supplement and and what you're already doing or or help to bolster up what's what's already happening in the jails and and go from there. So. 
Thank you, Arthur. And I would just add, you can work within community providers who yes. can provide physical and behavioral health clinical consultations. And in fact, we would love it if you if you do that. You don't have to have all this capacity in-house. We are getting that question quite a bit. Yeah. And so that's something else that we can talk with each facility about. Yeah. Great. Can so, I ask uh, provide please. a little bit of follow-up question? Um, so the reason this question came up for us is because we were looking at the credentialing requirements for our, I think it was for our community health workers. And on the DOH licensing site, it talked about um, reimbursement or not reimbursement, what did it say? Something about um, their credentials needing to be linked to a BHA facility. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're trying to figure out. Will we be eligible to bill for their services if we're not licensed as a BHA facility? I can tell you from the community health worker standpoint, that is something that we're really working through internally. That is a that is a new benefit that we are standing up internally. And so um, we're having some really robust conversations with right now about what does a community health worker look like? How can we bill for that? And, and what does that look like for each facility? And, and how can we utilize that as a benefit internally? So that is that is a, a new a new benefit that we're working to stand up right now. So I would caution against you know going to the DOH website and coming and 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 cross-checking it like that because we're actually building it from the bottom up here. Okay, so the answer to this one is to be determined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The community health worker portion is to be to to be okay. determined. So, and, okay. and Arthur, this is this is a lot of uh, a lot of some of the work that we're talking about is actually bigger than than the MTP 2.0 yeah. reentry waiver. This is like much bigger. Yeah. This is like all of Washington, not just this particular project. So, just wanted to sort of call out some of these questions. Yep. Um, are bigger and are part of, and we're connecting to it because it's connected to some of our work, but it's, you know, we're a small slice of what the yep. big picture is of these things. Yep. Yep. 100%. And Amy, you have your hand up again, I'm assuming. Oh, I'm sorry. I was trying to put it down. Okay, great. I'll let you go. Oh, you did. Yay. Okay. There. Wonderful. Sorry. Thanks so much. Okay. I'm, I'm scrolling through to see if there are other questions or other hands. I'm not seeing any. And again, this is just open. We don't have an agenda. So if there are no more questions, we are happy to give you back your time, but wanna make sure that we're available. And Anna, I see your hand up. Is that, nope, down again, maybe? Okay. Anna, is your hands, okay. Is your hand still? So can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I do have a question. I was on a call earlier with Arthur Andrews where he presented that a, Social social workers would be in the jail and they would see every single individual prior to release. Is that part of this reentry initiative where they have the, their own case management, or are those two totally separate programs? I think I think this is going to tie with the TPA discussion as well, right? And so, um, you know, again, you know, I feel I feel like I'm saying the same thing over here. So, you know, initially what we looked at was, you know, an assessment is part of what needs to happen um, in the case management setting. And so, there are some rules and restrictions about who can do assessments in in the state of Washington. And so, initially, we were looking at the licensed social worker as being the person who could do it, but we're also trying to look at other roles and see who also can who also could do that assessment you know rns are somebody who can do that assessment and so we're really taking a look at that from from the point of view of we don't want to limit the workforce we want to allow whoever can do it to do it and 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 broaden that as as much as we can uh, you know while supplementing what you're already doing and possibly the tpa also stepping in and being able to help there emma i see you shaking your head is there something you'd add there I agree. And I think I would just add that we're talking about the case management service, and there's many different ways that we can meet the requirement of providing case management. And so I think Arthur is talking quite a bit about licensure requirements that folks would need yeah. to have to be able to bill for case management. We do anticipate that it could largely be staff that you already have in-house, but are essentially already doing this work, already doing screenings, already doing assessments and could start billing for the service if they just meet those licensure requirements and get enrolled. Do I 
Does, does that answer your question, Anna? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I remember that presentation, so, yeah. Yeah. What other questions do we have today? Or concerns. Yeah. And just as people are thinking, if you think of one just after this ends, you are free to please use the, the email that Emma put in the chat. That is that is where we are both receiving and responding. I know sometimes it's not quite as quick as people would like. We're working as fast as we can and as hard as we can to get these answers out. While we're waiting, uh, Lisa, just out of curiosity, if you're allowed to share, which are the four uh, DOC facilities that are going to kick it off? Um, the two reception centers, so WCC and WCCW, Mission Creek, um, which is our standalone female camp, and Coyote Ridge Correction Center on the east side of the state. Those are the first four facilities that um, we're going to launch and start preparations after we submit our letter of intent this week. Thanks. So, Lisa, for those that don't know the acronyms? Um so WCC is Washington Correction Center located in Shelton, Washington. Uh, WCCW is the Washington Correction Center for Women, which is our female reception center and residential uh, facility in Gig Harbor. Um, well, Purdy. And then um, uh, Mission Creek Correction Center for Women is a standalone camp and it's in Belfair. And then Coyote Ridge Correction Center is located in Connell, Washington. Yes, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. And and we're like the jails, I'm sure, in many aspects of of wanting to make sure we are we short staffed and we're doing those assessments. Um, we have a wonderful uh, young lady that's running our social worker teams in the state. And we're looking at the expansion of that. So, Anna, your question was perfect for, you know, are we meeting with every single person that's going to be releasing and of course the goal is yes, but they're gonna need different things. So you'll have some folks that already have a pretty good plan. They know where they're going. They don't need additional services um, and appointments set up versus somebody who has very high medical needs. And so Brooke's team is already having those types of conversations and and how we work with our reentry division um, to support those needs and then com communicate with our community corrections division to have that um, supportive transitional flow. So great questions. Can we get the Jeopardy music while we're waiting? Only if you sing it, right? I took eight years of uh, 10 years of music for a reason, not because I play a couple of instruments, but and that's the reason I don't sing. So you can play it, but you're not going to sing it. That's correct. I could play <laughs> it on double bass guitar and a few other things, but I, no, I'm not going to sing. Jeopardy melody on a double bass guitar would be interesting. So Lisa, there, oops, sorry, I, I'm sorry, Mark. Um, are there any questions out there? I'm curious because we're asking these same things. Are there any questions out there? I think I heard one about um, what if you don't have local community providers that are um, under a Medicaid and uh, uh, bill have the ability to bill Medicaid? And uh, I think that was one of the ones we were looking at. We're actually going to look at how we can do some recruitment and in areas in or in counties where that's not necessarily something that has been available in the past and build up our relationships. So um, are there anything out there like that as far as related to the waiver and, and what your concerns are? Because our goal is, and I, I'm saying this from a, a selfish standpoint, we'd like all the jails um, to to join us and and especially those that house our violators, 
um, you know, so we can just support you as you support us in, in providing care for these folks in hopes they don't return. So just throwing it out there. I so appreciate that point. And I'll just add on to that, that for the smaller facilities, rural facilities in particular, our expectation is not that you're hiring a whole bunch of people and doing all this in-house. Again, our expectation is that you're identifying community-based providers who are probably already working with these folks and help them provide care and be able to be reimbursed for services that they provide in a facility. And so to the extent that you're thinking through who can we work with in the community and this here is an area where we feel like we have a really big gap and we really just don't know what to do about how do we provide this type of service. But those are actually some of the questions that we're going to be asking you as part of the capacity building application. So you can identify holes for us and then we can help work through how to how to fill them. And I'll just jump in. Uh, WASPIC has a uh, program through HCA uh, for small and remote facilities who do not have services. Uh, it's through telemed. Uh, Kurt, Mr. Kurt Lutz uh, is our program uh, coordinator. And uh, anyone can, I'll put my and Kurt email addresses in the chat here in a moment, and you can contact us. And this is for the folks who are not uh, corrections or security staff. The, those folks mostly know it. But if you're concerned, get a hold of us or get a hold of your jail administrator, have them get a hold of us. They know us, and uh, we'll get them. Uh, we're visiting different small facilities uh, this summer and getting folks signed up so that they can meet and segue into this program. Thank you. Mark, go ahead. Yeah, are we, um, I'm thinking about uh, insurance and malpractice. I know that the uh, Office of the Insurance Commissioner is working on the practitioner, uh, the physician, nurse practitioner, PA insurance issue, which is huge. Um, but is there a parallel issue with um, these other community providers who we're, we've been talking about? And if so, are we... Uh, in other words, do they, I'm, I've, I have to assume that they also have insurance. Um, and I'm wondering if the question is going to come up at whether they're considered providing care in the community, if they're just reaching in or if they're actually providing care in a correctional setting, uh, jail or prison. And at that point, or if they're going to run into insurance issues. So are we, are we working on it? You know, we received that question when we went and did a round of site visits, especially about the costs associated with working in a facility. And so I think that those costs could be covered by the capacity building funds that we're going to provide. But I think we should also take this question back and follow up with a, a larger written response, yeah. especially if, if the insurance commissioner has a, additional detail that we could provide. Yeah. And it's not just, uh, just Emma, it's not just the cost, but it's also simply the availability of that. You know, there's some so, okay, good. Thank you. That's helpful. Thank you. I'm not seeing any other questions. Well, maybe we can let folks off early today. And I can stick around for a couple of minutes, but thank you everybody for attending. Appreciate it. Take care, everybody. Thank Bye. you all. Bye. Thank you. I'm going to go catch my flight. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>so you'll see uh with the times with the times perfect yes i will i'll uh i'm just gonna look at that thanks